Take the case of Fernando Bermudez. Five people testified against him, and the judge put him away for life. But was he wrongly convicted of murder? Dick Brennan is here now with an exclusive report for us on this. Dick? Well, Ernie, Fernando Bermudez had an alibi. He says he was driving around with friends. There was no physical evidence against him, no blood, no gun, but there was no getting around those witnesses until now. Tonight, a UPN 9 investigation raises serious questions about the role of police and prosecutors in this case. Mary Ann DeBerry, with the father's help, was able to track down all the witnesses who testified against Fernando and get them to admit that, under pressure, they gave false testimony. An NBC News investigation shows if those witnesses are now telling the truth, then Fernando Bermudez is the wrong man. A young man sent away for the rest of his life. They arrested him and they threw away the keys. They never did another bit of investigation. Accusations of police misconduct. Is this man behind bars for a murder he did not commit? You'll be surprised to hear how he ended up in prison and why the eyewitnesses who put him away now say they made a big mistake. Tonight, a rally in support of a man who says he's been wrongfully imprisoned for 14 years. There was no physical evidence, just eyewitnesses who now admit they were wrong. Now his family wants the courts to do the same. Free Fernando! Free Fernando! Free Fernando! I have been sentenced to 23 to life for a crime I did not commit. For most, Thanksgiving is about being thankful. For Fernando Bermudez, it's about being free. It's been a year of mixed emotions and unforeseen challenges since I left Sing Sing. Bermudez was imprisoned for 18 years, serving someone else's time for a murder he didn't commit. I can forgive, but I can't forget. In jail, they called him the professor. Now, almost a year after being exonerated, Fernando Bermudez took his teaching skills to Columbia University. The crime of wrongful convictions begins like a water torture, dripping cold reality, minute by minute, day by day, year to year. In 1991, Bermudez was sent to prison for murdering a teen outside of a club in New York City. After five witnesses misidentified him, he was sentenced to 23 years to life. Such a situation can erode a person's self-esteem. It can erode your personal dignity if you don't try to maintain it. After Bermudez was convicted, the witnesses who put him behind bars recanted their testimonies, revealing that prosecutors and police had pressured them into pinning Bermudez as the killer. The trial was so lopsided. The stories that witnesses gave at trial did not make sense. They were inconsistent with each other. In my situation, the illegal identification procedure coupled with the witnesses allowing to speak with each other made a bad situation worse. But Bermudez is not alone. Eyewitness misidentifications are the number one cause for wrongful convictions in the United States. Bermudez's case is an example of how difficult it is to overturn convictions without forensic evidence. We have 261 DNA-based exonerations. How many more do we have that are non-DNA-based? Like myself. But besides his legal message, Bermudez hopes his story serves as an inspiration for the students. I want to encourage everyone that whatever happens in life, you can overcome adversity. Now a free man, Bermudez is determined to bring justice to the judicial system that took 18 years of his life. For ABC News, I'm Julie Strauss. More than 250 convicted prisoners have been exonerated on the basis of DNA testing in the U.S. alone. Eyewitness misidentification played a role in more than 75 percent of those cases, making it the leading contributing factor to wrongful conviction. But unfortunately, witnesses are often wrong. How can this happen, and is it possible for us to prevent these eyewitness identification errors from happening? Thank you for introducing me, Betty Ann. Thank you, David Dean Logan, for assisting this event, and Greg Rosenfeld for your commendable professionalism. I thank my family and supporters, including my wife, Crystal, who helped me drive this far distance from Connecticut, and my esteemed counsel, Barry Pollock, from Washington, D.C. Most importantly, I thank God, creator of heaven and earth, who made this day possible 
for giving me back my freedom, which I appreciate so much. I am elated to be here at Roger Williams University School of Law. Happy to see Betty Ann Waters and Alba Morales and fellow crusading attorneys who I look forward to getting to know better and working with in the future. Being here is actually an honor for me because in Rhode Island, our smallest state in the United States, big developments are happening. For example, in December 2010, a Rhode Island task, for, task force formed in connection with state legislators, and they issued a final recommendation to improve the accuracy of eyewitness identification, which you have heard is the leading cause of wrongful convictions by 75%, in fact. Had these improvements been instituted in New York in the summer of 1991, of August 3rd into the 4th, perhaps I would have been spared the agony of over 18 years in New York State maximum security prisons for a crime I had nothing to do with. It's hard to believe that something happened like this. I never thought it would happen to me. I had heard about the growing problem of wrongful convictions when I was sort of like an ignorant youth growing up in the Washington Heights of Upper Manhattan in the Inwood section. But I had hopes for my life at that point. I had enrolled in college, and I had just taken my placement test to enter the medical profession. I wanted to make my parents proud. I wanted to contribute to society. I wanted to make a difference. But two days later, in front of my home, I was arrested. With a gun to my temple, I was whisked to an undisclosed Lower Manhattan precinct. There, I was asked what I had done in the night of August 3rd into the 4th of 1991. In November 2009, before a rapt audience, camera snapping, and a hushed suffocation, as it were, the judge, Justice John Cataldo, in a noble and courageous step, declared me actually innocent, which made New York State legal history. He added that the state, that the prosecutor, knew and should have known that the state star witness was giving false testimony. He clarified that the identification procedures under which my identification occurred were horrible. And in connection with the actual innocence ruling, I was freed into the loving arms of my family, into a brave new world, as it were, where I had lost over 18 years of my life. I went in when I was 22, I came out when I was 40, lost, not knowing what's going on. Everything had changed. From the cell phones that were this big, were now this small. I was on the prison grounds when I left that day, and I was talking to Barry in Washington, D.C., and the car wouldn't start. And the rumor was that I was such a well-behaved inmate or prisoner that they wanted to keep me. But sure enough, finally, the car started. And I went home and embraced my children, who were born throughout my incarceration for the first time. I went into a world that had changed so much. The colors were dazzling me. Going into department stores scared me. There were so many choices. I even had trouble crossing the street, much less even driving, which I hardly had any practice with before my incarceration.